How y'all doing? 1030? Can we give it up for our online crowd? I said there's like 300 people online right now. Give it up for the online crowd. I got to make sure I do this because I'm not here all the time. I always forget to introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> my name is Pastor O. Uh, I oversee our Thursday night service, men's ministry, young adult ministry, and I'm usually helping Pastor Tyrone out over in Elk Grove. Um, we're going to continue our mini-series called Lessons from the Garden. Last week was a sermon about, um, was, a, was about in the first garden, the first man, Adam, right, in the Garden of Eden. Now this sermon is about the Garden of Gethsemane. This title is Growing in the Garden. And so for some of you that many of you probably don't know me, um, I played football for more than half of my life from the age of five till about 29. And so football, as you know, is a very dangerous and very violent sport amongst other sports. And uh, I made it out relatively healthy, played um, at Sacramento State, played professionally for seven years, played for one of the best teams on the planet. Um, You already know. (laughs) Not the Cowboys. Uh, <laughs> definitely. Any team that doesn't take people in free agency, don't, don't follow them. Um, anyway, so I made it out relatively healthy, but for whatever reason, no ACLs, MCLs, this left ankle, I kept spraining it over and over again. It got so bad to, my last, to, to where my last two seasons, I went and saw this legendary doctor named Dr. Ting in the Bay Area. And he said, man, he showed me the, the, the scan and he said, you have an OG ankle. I said, I'm too young to have an OG ankle. He showed me all the bones. There's like 11 different bone spurs. He said, we can go in there and shave it down, but it's looking bad. You might want to consider not playing football anymore, but I didn't listen. I was young at the time, and I kept on playing. So by the time I retired in 2009, we were having our first child. It was bad. It was so bad to where there were times I would wake up in the morning, and it would be the most excruciating pain, and I had to walk like an OG. (laughs) But... It was so tough because I have, at this time, at the time, I think we had a newborn, a three-year-old, and a six-year-old, and they would always come up to me and say, Daddy, Daddy, we want to go out and play. Can we go run? And I would tell them no, and they had no idea why I was telling them no. It was because I physically couldn't do it. And so there was times where I would break down, like, God, there is no way that this is going to be my existence until I die. Like, what, what can I do? But sometimes the hardest decision is doing something you don't want to do, but you know you have to do. So I started doing some research, and a doctor told me about this thing called stem cells. And so they said, you can get some stem cells. I found two, two real OGs that had it done, and they said, it actually worked. You can spend a lot of money, and it won't take, and you'll waste your money, but it actually worked for us. You should look into it. So I did the research, but apparently I didn't do enough research because when I came in there for the stem cells, I saw this big old horse needle. And I said, well, where are y'all about to put that at? <laughs> First red flag is when I walked into the uh, doctor's office, they didn't have a professional. They had some young lady, some intern, and she's supposed to be drawing my blood. She pokes me four different times before she can find, I said, nope, 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 nope. Can we get, can we get a professional? They finally draw my blood. That's strike one. So then I don't know this because I didn't read everything. They say, you're going to lay on your stomach, pull up your shirt. All of a sudden I hear the sound of a saw. And they, there's this drill, they drill, I found out, through your skin, through your hip bone, into the hip bone, and they pull your own bone marrow out nice and slow. And then I, I made the mistake of looking at it. I said, what is all this yellow and red stuff? I said, that's what we're going to take. We're going to combine it with this acid, and then we're going to inject it into the troubled areas. And so... I was willing to go through that, the most excruciating pain I've ever dealt with in my life. And I'm praying that this, uh, the cartilage regrew, praise God, and I'm praying that I never have to go do it again. I don't know if I can do it, but I was willing to do it for the sake of my children. I was willing to do it for the sake of my children. Now, let me ask you this. When's the, the, the last time you set aside your feelings so you can move by faith? What did you do that helped you get prepared for whatever it was that you were dealing with? Maybe it was a tough conversation. Maybe it was the ending of a relationship. Maybe it was an unexpected diagnosis or some family trauma. We all have that. Maybe it was that job loss. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure there were people you counted on to pray for you, be with you, even counsel you in those moments. But what if the people you can usually depend on during tough times don't come through and they leave you hanging? 
Well, <laughs> Jesus is familiar with this scenario. Even Jesus experienced moments where his soul was overwhelmed and the people he counted on and asked to help him out, the people that he depended on, let him down. So how does Jesus respond to the pressure that he felt? So for a moment, take an honest inventory of yourself. How do you often respond when you feel this immense pressure in life? Because the reality is most of the times, uh, for some people, the lights are too bright. But for others, they thrive and they embrace the challenges that come. And so let me give us a little context before we get into the, the content. A little biblical background. All throughout scripture, Jesus demonstrates to us how to prepare for life's battles. And one of his most intense battles is about to happen. It's an internal one on the Mount of Olives. Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, it's, it's, it's located at the foot of the Mount of Olives. Gethsemane literally meaning oil press. It's a place of pressure where the olives get pressed to produce that oil. <laughs> See, Jesus frequently went there with his disciples and he was in town. This was his primary place to, pr uh, primary place to pray. And they say there's a saying in the sports world, success leaves clues. So I'll ask you, that, ask you guys this question. Do you have a primary place to pray? Do you have a place where you can turn and run to the Lord? Even if everyone else lets you down, you have your own secret place. And maybe you don't, like I was back in the day when we didn't own a home or have an apartment. I would just go walk around the block and talk to the Lord. Do you have a place that you can run to? Now, understand this. As we flesh out this story, this is Jesus' last night before his crucifixion. And he knows what's about to happen. And it's going to be a long night for him and an even longer day for our Lord. So for us, Gethsemane is the place where we get to decide if our feelings win or our faith. And so the big idea that I want us all to leave here with this morning is when everything fails, when everyone else fails, God won't. He will lift us up. Amen. Amen. So here's the first point. Growing, we must grow through obedience. In, in February, I talked about how Harriet Tubman was obedient to uh, going back, returning to free more slaves. Now, I don't know if I have that kind of faith to march 100 miles to Maryland to be free. That's already enough faith. But then to come back more than 13 times to free others, many of which didn't know they were slaves. And she did this because she didn't. She didn't do it, be, I don't know if this is going to make sense to you, she didn't do it because she had to, but she had to because she was called to. See, there's things that you don't have to do, but you're going to because you're called to, regardless of what you must go through. Let, let's, let, let's examine what Jesus did despite knowing what is coming. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 26. And read about the Last Supper. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given, it, given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What we see here is Jesus making preparations to eat the Passover with his disciples and institute the Lord's Supper. 
while already knowing that Judas would betray him. Now, this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. Jesus is a better man than me because ain't no way I'm knowing that this dude is going to betray me, eventually leading to my death, and I'm going to be breaking bread with him, drinking wine with him, reclining at the table with him, washing his feet. I'm not eating anywhere with him. I'm not taking him to Chick-fil-A. It is not my pleasure. But Jesus knows that he's instituting something we still be doing today. He was faithful. Communion, the Lord's Supper, the bread representing his body and the cup representing his blood, which he knew was about to literally be shed less than 24 hours from this moment. He was obedient. He knew his purpose and no one or nothing was going to stop him from fulfilling it. So you can talk back to me. Why does Judas betray Jesus? Money. For money. This this is why we can't just go along with whatever the culture says. Right? What's the saying these days? Secure what? Secure the bag. Judas secured it. But at what cost? What does it profit a man to gain 30 pieces of silver and let and yet lose his soul. See, there was a recent story about Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal, telling recently retired um, Philadelphia Eagles center Jason Kelsey. He said, bro, please retire. Be with your family. You've done enough. You know why Shaq told him that? Because Shaq secured the bag and lost his family. He said, I'm sitting here in this 30-plus bed- bedroom house all by myself because I prioritize that over a real, my real relationships. You see, Judas was a thief and also one of the disciples that got mad that the woman with the alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume, poured it on Jesus' head. They started making up all these excuses on how they could have blessed the, 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 the poor, but that wasn't Judas's heart. If you read Matthew, the very next verse, it says, Then Judas went to the chief priest and asked him, What type of bag can I secure to give up Jesus? And they were excited about it. They said, We'll give you 30 pieces. And he said, Bet, deal. And he did it. An- another question, I don't know if you've ever uh, asked yourself this. Why would Jesus allow Judas to be the treasurer of his nonprofit? If you ain't good with money, you, ain't, you, can't, hold the, you can't hold the money. You can't hold the bag. But, but maybe he wanted to show us what being obedient despite our circumstances looks like. Judas shows us where self-sufficiency gets us, but Jesus shows us that if we had just remained faithful, if we'd stay in the fight, stay in our lane, and stay in his will, God will lift us up. there's, There's something else that God uses to lift us up when we're preparing for battles, and I know most of you do this. See, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark point this out, but it's easy to miss because it's literally just one sentence. In Matthew 26 and 30, it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus knows what's coming and decides, hold on, we need to worship before the war. That's why worship is a main part of service. It's it's internal preparation. That's why we worship together before we dive into God's word. There's a story in 2 Chronicles 20 uh, uh, about a vast army coming against, coming against Jehoshaphat. As a matter of fact, two different armies are coming against Jehoshaphat. And the very first thing Jehoshaphat does is what do you think? He prays. He prays. He prays. In verse 12, he says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This army is too vast. We will get utterly destroyed. We don't know what to do, Lord, but our eyes are on you. And through seeking the Lord, through praying, they were told that the battle wasn't theirs and that they would see the salvation of the Lord if they just stood still. Now, in verse 21, Jehoshaphat puts men on the front lines. So if you watch uh, uh, all the movies, Braveheart, Gladiator, you're thinking, oh, they sharpened their swords and they did. They had the guys with the bows and arrows. That's not who they put on the front lines. God already said the battle is mine. Who do you think Jehoshaphat put on the front line? Worshippers worshipers to sing that doesn't make any sense it doesn't seem to make any rational sense yeah go out singing 
Go out singing in front of it. If I saw that in football, I would have laughed at dudes like, what, what, what are y'all doing? But this Christian lifestyle is paradoxical. Oftentimes things don't make sense. It tells us to die daily. Die so you can live. The last shall be first. Worship. The battle's already mine. In verse 22, it says, as they begin to sing in praise, as they begin to sing and praise the Lord, set ambushes against the men who were invading Judah and they were defeated. See, see, sometimes we're going to have to physically fight and take up arms. God will still be with us. But there's other times through prayer, through worship, God will reveal to us that through our prayerful obedience that the battle belongs to him. I don't know about you, but sometimes worship is war for me. That's why I don't care what I look like to anybody else around during praise and worship because you have no idea what I've been going through. You have no idea the amount of pressure that I'm under and nobody in this room can cause transformation in my life but him. So I focus my attention and praise towards the one that can provide change in my life. Sent the worshipers out. The battle's already mine. Start thinking, and what if we had that perspective? You already won, just start praising me. Jesus shows us that worship is a part of preparing for battle. It's a way that we, we too can remain obedient. If no one else is with me, I can still worship God, and he promises he'll lift me up. Point number two is this, growing through prayer. See, hopefully this makes sense. Sometimes we have to go through prayer so we can grow through prayer. I don't always, even as a pastor, I don't always want to pray. But every single time I start calling on the name of the Lord, I start confessing, I start repenting, and I feel his presence. I feel this peace that comes over me. I'm glad that I did it. It's the same thing reading the word. There's times where I don't really feel like opening the scripture. As soon as I do it, I'm like, man, I'm so glad I did I need to do this more often. There's that peace that you can just feel his presence as you're abiding in the living word and living scripture. Sometimes we don't go through it. We have to grow through it. Here we see Jesus take the 11 into the garden, 12 minus 1, because Judas is already going to do what he's done, what he's going to do, because Satan at that point had already filled him, had already entered him. But he takes the 11 to the entrance of the garden, but then he only takes his boys, his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, a little bit deeper into the garden, and then he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, this messes with my theology or my, 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 the practical nature of how I grew up because my dad's from Compton, 6'3", 225, ex-military, you didn't cry growing up. You got socked in your chest if you cried. And so when I'm reading, like, hold on. But when I'm reading scripture, I see John 11:35, 35, sh- the shortest verse in Bible. Jesus wept. Hey, dad, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus wept. Listen, you don't have to be all right all the time. Even Jesus is seemingly dealing with depression. If Jesus is dealing with it, I can deal with it too. Even his soul got overwhelmed to the point of death. This is what the Bible says. But he didn't let his emotion affect his devotion. He stayed. He remained on mission. There's something that I'm called to do. I might be feeling something, but I'm still going to do, I'm still going to remain faithful and finish what I was called to do. The, the, the great <laughs> Bay Area theologian, uh, Marshawn Lynch, he once said, you got to be about that action, boss. You got to be about that action. He was saying, after you put in the work, after you put in the time, after you've prayed, after you healed, there's still work to be done. You can feel what you feel, heal what needs to be healed, but then keep going. Though divine, we see Jesus sharing fully in the human condition. Jesus is dealing with grief and sorrow, agony and anguish. He prays three times for a reprieve, but never a reprieve from the will of God. So three times, he doesn't ask God to change his mind, his will about what he's doing. He just says, can you do it a different way? (laughs) In Matthew 26, verse 36 through 46, it says, under under the title of Gethsemane, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. 
he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now, when you read the word, it's, it's good to go through the entirety of the synoptic, synoptic gospels to see what are the other books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, what are they saying about the same story? If you read the first prayer in the next book, Mark, he uses a word. It doesn't say father, it's Abba. Abba is an Aramaic word used to address God in relation to personal intimacy. So if you have kids, you understand this. It's like those moments where your kids cried out, Daddy, Daddy, please. This is what Jesus is doing. I remember the last time I cried out to God like that. It was when my 11-year-old daughter, it was the time when she was four years, four years old, our HVAC had went out in our first home. And she had a feveral seizure. Now here's what's scary. We always had the kids go upstairs and play. For whatever reason, we decided to have her be downstairs. She falls off the couch. Her arms go up. She starts seizing. I literally think I'm watching my daughter die. I cry out, Father, please save my daughter. I was helpless. This is how Jesus is crying out, Abba. Not the, not the, not the God side of Jesus, the human side. Father, please, if there is another way, please show me. But what we see here is that Jesus' first resort is to pray. It was a regular rhythm for him. Prayer is what prepared Jesus for the reality of the cross. See, he was never concerned about what he would miss while he was away praying. Like after feeding the 5,000, he tells them, go to the other side. And then he goes up to the mountain to be alone with his father. He wasn't concerned about missing out. He was just concerned about missing being in the will of his father. He said, I only do what the father tells me to. So check this out. In verse 39, it says, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. In verse 42, it says, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it. This is in between prayers. So something happens, prayer shifted things. Something changed between the first and second prayer. You have to look closely, but even what Jesus says is slightly different. He goes from saying, if it is possible to if it is not possible. After the first prayer, he confronts the disciples for sleeping and not praying with him. But after the second prayer, he sees them and leaves them there. Something is changing. It seems like the realization is setting in. He goes from crying, Abba, 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 why are y'all sleeping? To now he prays and he sees them sleeping and he's like, Something, something is shifting, and the realization is setting in, I'm going to have to do this. i got to do this. And even if no one else is with me, Father, you are. So here's what changed between the first and second prayer. Again, going to the next book in Luke, chapter 22, verse 43, between the first and second prayers, it says that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. See, sometimes one prayer is not enough. You need to keep praying and keep praying and keep praying and persevere until God dispatches his heavenly host to come and minister to you and strengthen you. If Jesus had to do it, we better be doing it. Prayer will do something inside of you. It'll have you saying, God, don't change your will, change my mind. 
Nevertheless, nevertheless, maybe we need to add that to our, to our lexicon. Even, even if I don't like it, even if I still have questions, even if I think my way is better. Who in here can testify that they know that they know that they know God's way is the best way for us to live. God's plan is the plan that we should be living by and following. There's times that it's late and I've been in meetings all day and my wife wants me to wash dishes and I absolutely hate washing dishes. So I won't say anything while she's downstairs, but as soon as she goes upstairs, I just say, nevertheless. (laughs) Now this isn't theological, but you know, happy a spouse happy house, and I go and wash those dishes. But on a serious note, I'm not just up here talking about what I don't know. Prayer is literally my, my superpower. During our third pregnancy, the first two of my wife, no epidural. She said, I don't want, don't touch me, no nothing. I'm just going to thug it out and have these kids. <laughs> so we're going on baby three. And if you have kids, you know every child is different. And so we're having all these complications with our third child, who's over there right now in Children's Church, and they're telling us, not she might, she's going to have Down syndrome. There's all these different things they're saying about my child. There's this bump on her back, and they're, they're, they're giving us a, a, um, a report like the, like the 12 spies, the, or the 10 that gave the bad report. And so we continue to pray. Isn't it funny that when you're really going through something, you know who to call on because you know they'll pray? So we called on the people, not the people that we all knew that said they're Christians, the people that we knew were going to pray, and we told them, here's what's going on. And we continued to pray and pray and pray. And then we got another report that, no, your daughter, she looks, she looks healthy. She looks healthy. So now it's time for her to be born. And um, the first two, there was a, a, a few of the care team, physicians and doctors and nurses, but this time there was like eight people in the room, and we're wondering what's going on. And so my, water, uh, my wife's water had broke, but we didn't know exactly when the water broke. And if you don't know that, it throws off the timing of, every, of everything. And so they weren't sure when the water broke. So now they weren't sure on the timeline with her dilation and when the baby should come. And so they're, they're putting all this pressure on her. You need to, we need to do a C-section and cut your stomach open and get the baby out. And my wife's like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And she works for Kaiser, so she tells him, I know it costs 10000 more to do a C-section. Y'all just trying to get money. Y'all trying to secure the bag. <laughs> trying to secure the bag. <laughs> so I don't want y'all to cut me open. I want to have it naturally. They're putting all this pressure. Then they're saying the baby's heartbeat is irregular. We need to go inside your womb and clip something to the baby's head. So she has to endure that. And then all of a sudden, now they're saying, it is time to get this baby out. What are you going to do? My wife looks me straight in my face and said, babe, you need to pray. So it's us in the room. It's us in the hospital. There's like 10 doctors and nurses. They keep coming out. They're staring at us. And we just start calling on the name of the Lord in front of all of them. Again, I don't care who's in the room. I'm like, Father, you need to move. You need to do something. Father, please open up her womb. Do something. And I start praying and calling on the name of the Lord. And it was probably like a 60-second prayer. Ladies, I don't know how long it takes to go from 7 to 10 centimeters. But as soon as I said amen, the doctor said, I see the baby's head. Push. And our miracle baby was born. Our miracle child was born. My wife realized maybe what Jesus did in the garden. My body was made for this. I have to go through this for the sake of my child. It's the same thing. God saying, Jesus, you need to go through this for the sake of my children. Don't change your will, God. Change my mind. Get my mind and my body ready to deliver this baby. See, but sometimes the pressure, it's not for everybody. So everybody does not need to know what you're going through. Don't post about it. Pray about it. Don't post about it. Because the reality that most people aren't looking for God, they're looking for gossip. But even if you feel like no one else is with you, God is. He's the one that will lift us up. Here's the final point. Growing through perseverance. Growing through perseverance. For some of us, the struggle isn't to keep praying. (laughs) It's to make time to pray at all. Do I really have time to pray with everything going on in my life, with my kids' sports and their schedules and all these jobs I have and, you know, how busy I am? I don't have any margin, but I'd ask us all to wrestle with this. 
what does a lack of prayer signal to God? What is signals of self-sufficiency? It's like telling God, this is one of the, this is one of the most wild things you can tell God. I got it. Because then he's going to tell you, all good. Let me know how that works out for you. It's like telling God my time, talent, and money is all I need. And to make it as plain as possible, prayerlessness is telling God I don't need you. But thank God for the example of Jesus who always prayerfully waited for God's directions. Jesus was literally praying late in the midnight hour. His arrest had to have taken place no later than 3 a.m. because he completed six different trials that morning. Three before Jewish officials and three before Roman officials. And he was up on that cross for us by 9 a.m. I told you it was a long night. No wonder. I, the disciples get a bad rap. And uh, as I was preparing for this and really studying, I'm like, oh, I used to talk bad about them. Like, How are you going to sleep when Jesus asks you to, to pray? But then as I got the full context of the story, I'm not even mad at them anymore. They were up all night eating, drinking, and it wasn't Welch's grape juice. They were being taught by Jesus. They probably, being serious, had the itis. So... Imagine, I know, I know none of you still turn up, but imagine those days when you used to turn up and then you got home at like 1 a.m. or whatever time it was and then your friend says, hey, come with me to this garden and pray with me for an hour. They were asleep. <laughs> I'm not mad. It makes sense. They never went to sleep. They were up all night and then drinking and eating with Jesus being taught and then he asked them to go around midnight, late in the midnight hour to go pray. See, in those moments, they were asleep, but it's time for us to wake up. We need to pray not to check a box, but to get spiritually prepared for whatever's coming. And that's the reason why we should pray, because we have no idea what's coming. I, I say this often, but maybe there's prayers God hasn't answered simply because we haven't prayed them yet. Jesus prays until he's ready. Again, one prayer might not be enough. You got to keep on praying. In Luke 18, there's this parable of the persistent widow. And in verse 1, it tells us what this entire parable is about. It says, then Jesus told his disciples this parable to show them that they should always pray and never give up. And what we see here is the result of Christ's perseverance. It's obvious now after going from Abba, Abba, help me, he's now ready to go. He says, look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This is a different Jesus than the one we saw full of anguish and sorrow. The one crying, ah, but this is now the lion preparing to become the lamb. The last scripture for today is going to be out of John chapter 18, verses 2 through 4. It says, now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen, went out and asked them, who is it you want? You see, Jesus goes to the garden to get away, but now he comes out of the garden to meet them. To meet who? In verse 3, it tells us Judas came with a band of men. The Greek word for a band of men is spira, which describes a military cohort of 300 to 600 well-trained soldiers. So I always picture Jesus, Jesus just walking up with a few people. He had at least 300 to 600 soldiers with him, as well as the temple officers and some of the chief priests. Just for one man. It makes you wonder, what did he tell them about Jesus? <laughs> Judas was a fool, but he wasn't blind. He'd seen Jesus do the miraculous time and time again. He'd heard Jesus preach these sermons that we all now study and meditate on. See, this is why I don't care about how many sermons you've heard. Judas heard them all. One of my favorite passages of scripture is a tree is known by its fruit. A tree can't talk. You can look at it and see if it is what it's saying it is. So what's the, what's the, the, the fruit of, of Judas? The fruit of Judas is this. He walked with Jesus, but never followed him. 
He walked with Jesus but never actually followed him. His heart was never in it. He secured the bag but never secured his salvation. We, we, we end up selling ourselves short when we choose our way over Yahweh. And, and, and Jesus is about to remind them all who has the real power. And maybe we need a reminder, too, of who the real source is, that his substitutionary sacrifice was actually voluntary. Jesus says, you don't take my life. I lay it down. <laughs> and in verse 4 through 6, it reads, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them. So first we see Jesus retreating to pray. Now he's coming out and he's asking them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He says, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they, all 300 plus men, all drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus here is using the divine name, the same self-designation that God revealed to Moses when when Moses asked God, who do I tell Pharaoh sent me? And his response was, tell him I am. Tell him I am. See, when we sing there's power in the name of Jesus, it's not just some little Sunday song. There's power in the name of the Lord. Whoever it is that you need him to be, he is. There's a current cultural saying that says, I'm him. No, he's him. Here we see Jesus showing us how to, how to persevere until the power comes. Persevere, we have to persevere until our flesh is defeated, however long that takes. What marked Christ's life was total dependence upon his father. Here's the final thought as we close. What marks your life? What marks your life? We can look all throughout scripture and look at Joseph, the dreamer. What marked his life, it says several times, God was with him. Daniel, faithfulness. I don't care if you kill me. I'm going to pray to my father. I'm not bowing down to these idols. What marks your life? When they write the story about your life, will they say that even when everyone let me down, you never gave up because God, you lifted me up. You see, you might be in a season right now of being pressed and that's okay. Understand this, God's not doing it to you. He's doing it for you. He's trying to teach you something. You have to keep going, keep trusting, keep pressing, keep praying. See, we get to decide how we respond to the pressure. Right? Decide. Side literally means to kill off. So homicide, pesticide, whatever. Side, it all means to kill off. Decide means to kill off every other option. So God wants us to decide to kill off every other option that keeps us from running to the Lord. So no more excuses, run to the Lord. No more complaining, run to the Lord. No more gossiping, run to the Lord. If you need to run your mouth, run it to the Lord. No more self-sufficiency, run to the Lord. Right now, if you're overwhelmed, it's okay. Jesus was too. Run to the Lord. And even if you ain't in shape, just start running (laughs) to the Lord. Because he says, those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and faint not. Even if everybody else lets you down, even if you're tired, even if you're weary, you can just run to the Lord. Even if everyone lets you down, God won't. He can't. It's literally not in his nature. God will lift us up. God will lift us up. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. I thank you that by your very nature, it is impossible for you to fail us. So it's baffling sometimes that we don't turn to you because you're the only one that has never let us down. Forgive us for the times we don't persevere in prayer. Forgive us for the times that we're not obedient. Forgive us for the times that we don't stay on mission. We thank you for who you are. We thank you that you mark us and seal us with your very spirit. It's our comforter. It's our counselor. It's our master teacher. That we literally can call on you. We can turn to you. Your word says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and they are saved. 
So I pray that you bless us as we leave from here, that we can apply what we learned today, dear Lord, and be better because we've made decisions to wholeheartedly follow you. Maybe we haven't prayed like we should, and we can recommit and rededicate and say, Father God, now is the time. You can be like the disciples and say, teach me how to pray if you don't know or fully understand. So we ask that you would continue just to cover us and keep us as you always have. And let us be rightfully accused of being abiders in you. People that don't just come to church, but people that truly trust you. People that follow, not just walk with you, but follow you. We give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory, dear Lord, because it only belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen.